Nobody's saying no. So we'll talk about how accelerators are used, and then we'll take a, a break. Before I forget, um, during the break, I'm going to come up and take a look at some stuff we're going to talk about in the future. This is a superconducting <coughs> radio frequency cavity, something that might be used in an international linear collider. This is made of niobium. This is a superconducting material. Um, you can handle it, but don't take it out of the bag. Um, here's an amplifying device for antimatter. And here's some target material used to make antimatter protons. So how do we use accelerators at Fermilab? And I think from the middle, we'll just stop at 10 or 5. Um, Fermilab in its history has operated two kinds of physics programs, fixed targets and colliding beams experiments. Actually, we're doing both again. Originally, we conducted experiments by accelerating particles in what was called the main ring to some very high energy, sending them out of the machine like you saw in the synchrotron, and directing them, directing them towards the target material, maybe something like this. And when the particles hit the target, <coughs> a bunch of other stuff would be created. And we would have a detector downstream to see what was going on. So you have your particle, hit your target, some detector, our eyes, to see what resulted from that collision. We call that a fixed target experiment because the target was fixed. It didn't move and the particles moved towards it. With the Tevatron and this storage ring capability, it became feasible to store particles in the ring for a long time, hours or days, and we could send particles in both directions in the Tevatron simultaneously. We could steer them to hit each other head on in particular locations, and uh, we could put a detector where we had this predetermined collision point, put a detector there, and obviously we could call this a colliding beams experiment because head on at some predetermined point. That's the main physics program of the Tevatron we have today. I like to think of it as imagine a truck running into a stationary truck. You have two trucks, one's going 60 miles an hour, bangs into broadsides when at a traffic light. Pretty violent collision, right? But imagine if both trucks were going 60 miles an hour at each other, which is the more violent of the two collisions? Which is going to result in probably smaller pieces of debris? Yes? Probably the second one, the head on one. Well, let's look at particles. The energy of the collision can be used to produce <coughs> new particles, like we said earlier on. Mass and energy are equivalent. We've got to conserve energy and momentum, according to Einstein. So in the fixed target scenario, we've got to have some momentum left after the collision, because you have one at rest, one thing moving. So to conserve, you're going to have some energy afterwards. In the collider, particles are going in opposite directions, so both before and after the collision, you have zero momentum. So all the energy can be converted into new stuff. And of course, Albert said mass is just a form of energy. He's right. So as a comparison, real quick, here's a plot of beam energy from 0 to 100 GeV and the useful energy for new particles on the x on the y scale. In fixed target, you can see as we increase the beam energy for fixed target, your available energy for useful physics goes up very, very slowly. On the other hand, for colliding beams, it's going to go up at a rate of twice, twice the energy. Much more efficient, much more energy available to make new stuff. How do we do it? Um, in fixed target experiments, or how do we measure <coughs> the quality of the physics that's coming out? We use a, um, a parameter called luminosity. In a fixed target experiment, we're going to illuminate some target material with our beam. It's going to have a cross-sectional area, sigma. The rate of interactions is given by sigma over area of the target times the number of particles, uh, times the density of the target, times the length, times the number of particles per second. So the luminosity is given here. And the type of material used for the target as well as the rate at which the particles are hitting it determine the luminosity of the experiment. We'll go back to our cartoon from early on. Our source, our particles, our target, our detector. And how many particles are coming from our source and how dense our target is determines how much stuff we're going to see in our detector. In the collider, instead of having a fixed target, our targets are just the oncoming particles. So the interaction rate is still given by sigma over A, but times the number of particles in each group of beams times the frequency at which they're passing through each other. Or luminosity is given by the frequency times the number of particles divided by the area constrained by that beam. 
So in a collider, the luminosity depends on the beam size, the number of particles, and has units of one over some area times time. And that tells the experimenters how well, how high quality the collisions are. <coughs> Obviously, to gather data more quickly, you need lots of particles and small beam sizes. In the photon, for example, each beam of protons and antiprotons has between um, 10 trillion and 10 to the 13th particles per beam. Spot sizes of 6% of one millimeter, smaller than a human hair. In the collider, in order to increase the probability that the particles are going to actually hit each other, we squeeze into very small sizes. We squeeze them down as tight as we can. And at the interaction point, like we said previously, particle beams are only 60 micrometers wide, with a human hair or less. We use this perform we use this with a set of strong focusing quadrupole magnets, and we adjust their strength. So it's like a telescope. We have strong magnets near the collision point, they act like the objective lens, weaker magnets away from the collision point, they act like the eyepiece. We got a little cartoon to show you about that, our squeeze play. So along here is, this is our particle collision point. This is minus 25, plus 25 meters, either side of the collision point. And this is the distance, or this is the beam size in millimeters. What you see here is the horizontal beam size in red. Blue is the vertical beam size. And we can play this again, I think. And so watch what happens in the middle. We turn on the, we, we, uh, turn on the magnets at different strengths. And ultimately, we get a smaller beam spot in the middle. But at the expense of larger beam sizes further away. But when we're colliding, we can control that. The important thing is in the middle. So we change the strengths of the magnets to focus the beam stronger, increasing the chances for collisions. Briefly, some numbers. Maybe we have 9 times 10 to the 12 protons in the Tevatron. And it's harder to make antiprotons, so maybe a third as many. The frequency at which they're going around is given by this. We already know the area of the beam, so our luminosity is a couple times 10 to the 32nd per centimeter squared area per second. The cross section of a proton antiproton collision is that small. So we get and we wish to detect about 150 million collisions every second. And the collider detectors have to be able to gather, examine, sort, store data at that rate. And they do. And you'll hear more about that next week. Each proton, each antiproton, has an energy of 980 billion electron volts, 980 GeV, or 1.6 times 10 to the minus 7 joules. So the power delivery <coughs> in the collision region is only about 50 watts. Not a whole lot. And again, our luminosity is our source. Our cross section is the size of our target, which are the particles in the other beam. And our detector, our eye, has to detect that many collisions every second. And we're going to take a break right now. Let's come back in 10 minutes. <laughs>